Looking very, very calm and collected uh, by video, and, and you'll be able to see him soon, is um, Oliver Hartwich uh, from the New Zealand Initiative. Oliver, welcome. Lovely to have you back with us. Yeah, good morning, Sean. Great to be with you. All right. Now, we have just heard, and I've got to say, fiscal holes and all this stuff leaves me a little cold, but we've just heard David Seymour being magnanimous in victory that the claimed fiscal hole from Labor didn't exist and Treasury have backed him on this, but it raises a broader question after the first 100 days of action by this government. Has it actually tightened the nation's belt? Has it been fiscally responsible? Do you see a decent fiscal path out of the first uh, three months of this government? Well... To be completely honest, not yet. Um, but that's not to say that I'm dissatisfied with the first 100 days. I think the first 100 days were quite packed with political action, but it was mainly about undoing, about cleaning up. So there's hardly anything left of Jacinda Ardern's legacy, if there was one, after that first 100 days, because that new government basically cleaned it all up. I mean, fair pay agreements gone, the Lake Onslow pumped hydro scheme gone, and so you go through the ferries upgrade, you go through basically all of these little projects and they add up, of course, a lot, and that's all gone. We've also seen, as I believe, some really good first steps in education, and you know that I'm passionate about education, so what we're seeing there with Erica Stanford is really encouraging. So we are a big step uh, closer to getting a new curriculum for um, proper literacy teaching, proper mathematics teaching, and my colleague Michael Johnston is um, working on that with the minister and he's the chair of her ministerial advisory group. So I've got a bit of an insight into what's happening there and it's, it's really encouraging. So all of these policy areas are being dealt with simultaneously and I think that's encouraging. What I haven't seen yet, but maybe we'll have to wait for the budget, is of course the big strategy for fiscal policy. And when you say a strategy and fiscal policy, put it in layman's terms, how are we going to so, uh, save or make more money and live within in our means? Is, does that sum it up? Yeah, pretty much so. Um, but what I really want to see is some ambition. Because if you look at the current state of affairs, we all know we've got an enormous amount of debt after those last few years. We also know that government spending has increased a lot um, under that previous government. Now, what I would like to see is a bit of ambition where we just take things back to where they once were as a percentage of GDP. So, of course, we have to spend a little bit more because we've had population growth. Okay, take that. But um, where you currently have fiscal projections going is actually to a point where we would still spend more than Jacinda Ardern spent in her 2019 fabled wealth, um, well-being budget. Mm. So this is a government that doesn't even want to get us back to that level of government spending, let alone 2017. And so I would like to see a bit more ambition where we say, hey, um, we spend too much. We have a government that has grown too big. You can see this quite clearly with the public service that has grown to more than 60,000 people. You can also see it actually in the number of um, people on benefits, because despite having a very tight labor market near full employment, we have more people on benefit um, than before. Mm. Um, double actually. And so I think I would like to see the government actually spell this out. No, we want to take it back to where it was at least in 2019, ideally in 2017, maybe beyond that. But currently, this government plans to spend even more than Jacinda Ardern before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, Oliver, in that context, in that big context, I guess then we shouldn't be outraged at $800,000 speculative investment from the New Zealand Film Commission on a Jacinda Mania movie. We shouldn't be upset that the Reserve Bank is spending God knows how many hundreds of thousands hiring a diversity manager. Well, I'm not sure about why you are not upset, but I am because I think this is absolutely outrageous what we're doing here. This is exactly the kind of spending we got under the previous government, and that's exactly the kind of spending that needs to stop now. So $800,000 in the grand scheme of things, of course, is not much, but it's highly symptomatic. Why would we subsidize a feature film on a retired politician? Why would we now uh, hire uh, another well, you're, diversity? You're, you're going to hate it, Oliver, when I tell you we're actually spending money on a feature film about a current politician, the third movie with public money is being made about Chloe Schwabrick. I know, I know. 
And I think that all of this spending has to come to an end because um, the times are simply not right for that, if there were ever any right times for that kind of political hagiography. So uh, we have to really get back to basics and we have to cut any unnecessary spending. And if you ask me, this is um, part of it. Um, if you gave me the $800,000 to spend and I had to spend them, I would probably do it on an information campaign. Let the public know actually how bad our finances are because I think once you explain it to people in what dire circumstances we are, I think you will probably find some support for actually cutting the spending. All right. Can I ask you, uh, Oliver, what about this diversity hire, this diversity and equity position at the Reserve Bank? And I've got to say, it almost seems like a deliberate middle finger from the governor towards the new non-woke government. Yeah, it does look a bit like that, doesn't it? Mm. So um, just a few weeks after the government told the governor, hey, we've got a bit of a problem here and you better focus just on your single mandate of price stability from now on, he's basically just rubbing it in. He says, no, well, okay, um, you might tell me that, but I'm still hiring the people I want. And I think it actually takes a degree of chutzpah on behalf of the governor to go ahead with that. Yeah. I mean, the governor actually has many things to worry about and actually to hang his head in shame of all the things that he's caused. I mean, most notably and most noticeably, inflation. But that's not the only thing. I mean, most people probably aren't even aware of the fact that this Reserve Bank has cost us $11 billion. I'm not sure whether you've actually dealt with this on the platform, but it's um, the large asset purchase program that we undertook during the pandemic, where the government bought plenty of commercial paper, bonds, put them on the books, and now that interest rates are going up again, the paper is losing in value, but fortunately for Adrian Orr, he got an indemnity from the Minister of Finance, Grant Robertson, at the time. He gave him a free pass, didn't he? Exactly, and that guaranteed that taxpayers would then bail out the Reserve Bank when it <laughs> incurs losses on its investment. And that's now $11 billion that taxpayers have to pay the Reserve Bank so the Reserve Bank doesn't go under. Uh, this is ridiculous and this is outrageous. And I think for that alone, I think Adrian Orr should have considered or reconsidered his position.